les invito a quedarse hasta el final de la entrevista para poder oír qué es la promoción que se está ofreciendo con respecto a este libro y otros libros que podrán adquirir de Kerigman. Así que les invito a que vean toda la eh, transmisión y al final podrán saber detalles de la promoción para obtener este y otros libros. Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Este es Luis Alberto Jovel. En este día traéndole un invitado especial, Matthew Bates. Matthew Bates, how are you? Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Louis, for having me. And um, it's uh, I'm excited to have my work uh, made well known to a Spanish audience, and uh, thankful for you and the work that you're doing. Well, um, it's been a, a pleasure um, put, putting forward your work because uh, it's not it's not always that we get a new angle on a theme. Um, we always hear sola fide or say by salvation alone, but this allegiance alone, uh, in my view, is very proper in our in our current context, uh, where we are often called to to decide who we're going to follow. Um, we already save uh, as Christians, but we are called into to pronounce our allegiance to either to Jesus' way or to Caesar's way, and I believe that. Um, that this book is going to do great. And this is the book I'm talking about. This is the, the, the English uh, one. And you can see the Spanish one right, right here, <laughs> right here, which I also have on print. So so I uh, would like to thank Kerikma for, for providing also the book and, and for translating. So Matt, uh, can you tell us something about you? Um, where you're from, what you study, what you do family-wise? Well, I'm originally from Northern California, and uh, my father was a forester. So I, we kind of grew up in the mountains and uh, very rural area, so not the city, uh, more cows and trees. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, so uh, from there, then um, I ended up pursuing education in a variety of ways and uh, ended up uh, in Spokane, Washington, doing a physics degree. Um, but that didn't capture my heart. It was really as I was taking that physics degree, I took a New Testament course. And that New Testament course helped me to realize that although I knew the Bible, I wasn't reading the Bible very well and that I needed to dig in more deeply. And um, through that, um, I also revealed some sin issues in my life that I needed to take care of um, with the help of Jesus. Um, and so that mm -hmm. was a very transformative moment for me. This would have been my, my sophomore year during my undergraduate degree. Uh, and uh, so after that, I finished the degree in physics, uh, but was already beginning to think about uh, maybe studying theology or biblical studies. And uh, from there, I went to uh, Regent College after I got married. We got married, my wife and I, Sarah, and then headed to Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, where I got to study with Gordon Fee and with others. So that was a really uh, rich time of my life. Um, and then after that, I had gotten the biblical studies bug um, and really was interested in maybe pursuing that as a career, but I didn't know whether or not that would work out. So I went back and worked as an electrical engineer for a season, um, mm -hmm. which um, I had some training in that direction by that point, and then uh, onward and did a, a PhD eventually at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so it's an interesting journey as a Protestant, as I've studied both in um, you know Protestant context, but also in a Catholic context. Uh, but Notre Dame is a broad place, and uh, it was a very rich experience there too. Uh, yeah, I'm at uh, Quincy University now, uh, where I've been a professor for 13 years. Uh, so it's uh, in Illinois. Illinois. So so you grew up in the in the east in the west coast, um, and then uh, I. I when I saw that you went to Spokane, my mom lives in Kent, mm. Washington. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and yes, and Vancouver is just across the border. That's um, right. Uh, your PhD was, can you, uh, can, you can you tell us a bit about your PhD and, and who supervised you? 
Yeah, so the well, PhD was um, on the topic I chose was Paul's use of the Old Testament. And more specifically, does Paul have an overarching interpretive theory? Does he have a hermeneutic that he consistently applies when he's interpreting the Old Testament? Uh, so that was published eventually by Baylor University Press, um, the, the dissertation. The supervisor for that was David Ani, a Lutheran. So that, again, Im demonstrates something of the breadth of Notre Dame. Although I was yeah. doing a PhD at Notre Dame in a Catholic context, there was a Lutheran PhD supervisor. And yes, uh, they're very broad, a uh, broad school, from what I believe. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, th that's very interesting. Um, uh, your PhD, I guess, um, the use of the Old Testament uh, in the New Testament, and like uh, th there's some Hayes, um, mm -hmm. Richard Hayes, uh, has done yes. some, wor some work on it. Um, and this is something also in Jakey Bill, I mean, Jakey Bill, he did his PhD on the use of the New Testament by Daniel on the book of Daniel. Mm. Um, that's yeah. very fascinating. Uh, it is an interesting field. Yeah, Beale is a leader in the field. Um, yeah, Richard Hayes, mm. specifically on Paul's use of the Old Testament, was one of the yes. major dialogue partners. Yeah, some other leading people um, would be Francis Watson, who's at, at Durham, uh, mm -hmm. Professor at Durham, um, and then uh, Ross Wagner, who's at Duke, uh, would be some of the leading other voices that have worked on Paul's use of the Old Testament. So, yeah, it was a it was a really fun project. I I learned a lot from doing it, and. Um, it, yeah, it unlocked some other um, angles, um, the, not ones we're talking about today, but I've done some work on the doctrine of the Trinity that it, it connected to. So it really oh. led into some interesting additional yeah work for me. Well, uh, I like to someday dig into it because I, I do a bit of it. I mean, uh, I just do some general thing so I can pass on to my uh, to my viewers on my channel. Um, but it interests me because it leads you back into a theme of the canon um yeah. what canon they were using um uh, in, in in latin america there's a lot of talk about the septuagint uh, we having um that competition between protestants and catholics very much felt in latin america and some mm. latin americans rejecting the septuagint right off because it's being used by the by the it was used by Jerome and included the Duro canonical books and mm -hmm. so the rejection comes from there and while I'm I'm of the thinking that no uh Paul used it <laughs> if Paul used it then I don't have an issue with it <laughs> yeah so it, yeah the use of the old testament in the new is is uh, a rich and complicated and controversial topic at times mm. well let's get into five questions then um Matt and the first question is what inspired you to write Salvation by Allegiance Alone? And what key message do you hope to convey to your readers? So, yeah, that question kind of has two parts. First, what inspired it? Um, and I would say there, that really emerged from both the horizon of my experience and, and the horizon of my studies. As on the one hand, my experience in churches was that there was a certain kind of understanding of the gospel and certain kind of understanding of faith that I was like raised with, you know, a traditional Protestant understanding. Um, and um, on the one hand, I think that there's a lot of truth to that, but on the other hand, there may be some slight deficiencies in the model. And that's one of the things I, that, you know, gave rise to the book. Um, so on the one hand, it was like a, an experience that, that I had had, uh, but on the other hand, there was also scholarly studies that I was doing that made me realize that the word faith might mean something slightly different than um, I had been raised to believe that it meant, uh, but also, on the other hand, that the gospel itself might have a slightly different shape. Um, so some of the, the original impetus behind the study came from N.T. Wright, one of my very favorite scholars, um, and work that he had done um, on especially thinking about the gospel as a King Jesus gospel and uh, thinking about what it might mean to respond to a king with loyalty. So some of those ideas um, are connected to my reading of Wright that I was doing uh, way back when I was at Regent College. So this would have been like 2000 and you know um, 2000 2001 would have been uh, really when I was doing that um, those studies and I was reading N.T. Wright's uh, books like uh, he had the New Testament the people of God Jesus and the victory of God and he consolidated Jesus and the victory of God into a smaller book um, uh, and uh, that's called the challenge of Jesus so I was reading that and that 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 stimulated some things for me 
Uh, but as I continued and I was working on Paul's use of the Old Testament, um, one of the things that um, you might notice if you were to do careful work on Paul's use of the Old Testament, especially when you're looking at what's Paul's overarching theory of interpretation, what's his hermeneutic, is that he, a lot of his statements about how he interprets the Bible are bound up with the gospel. Um, and so beginning mm -hmm. you know, with Romans 1, 1, 1 through 1, 4, right, where he begins to talk about the gospel of God, right? He talks about the gospel um, of God that uh, as, as he's speaking about it, he speaks about it being connected to the prophets. And, and so we kind of see that there's, um, you know, an Old Testament framework um, in place, or when you go to 1 Corinthians 15, right, 3 through 5, where he speaks about Jesus dying for our sins, and then he, he backs it up by saying, in accordance with the scriptures, right? He died for our sins in mm. accordance with the scriptures. And so as I was thinking about, um, like, what, like, how was Paul interpreting the Old Testament? I was also doing really careful work on the gospel. And it was really as those things came together that I, that I, yeah, that the book was birthed. Um, so the second part of your question, though, um, has to do with, um, like, what's the key message of the book? And it really comes from the collision of those two separate ideas that um, make for, I think, a, a, at least a provocative um, new proposal for other scholars to consider. And that is, on the one hand, that we have had distorted ideas about um, the gospel, and that we've tended to think that the gospel is justification by faith, when in actuality, justification is better understood as a benefit of the gospel, and faith is how we should respond to the gospel, but neither one is the gospel. Um, that the gospel is that Jesus has become the king, and that in the process of becoming the king, like he, he takes on human flesh, dies for our sins, and so on and so forth, as and then is raised. But then the, the kind of key thing that's been left out is that Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God. So seeing the exaltation of Jesus mm -hmm. to the right hand of God as being really important within the gospel. So helping people like helping people to recover the emphasis on Jesus becoming the king as part of the gospel, and then marrying that with the idea of of faith as allegiance, like seeing faith not just as trusting in the promises of God, but more specifically allegiance to a king. So bringing those together, like I think, uh, leads to um, new ways of speaking about uh, uh, salvation theory. Yeah, it, it's um, what, what you said is very telling, and, and I can see into right influence because that also influences me as well. When you said that justification by faith is not the gospel, but it's a uh, a, uh, an effect of the gospel um, um, justification by faith is according to right, and I think he's right that he um, that is more of um, defines who we are, mm -hmm. um, but we become that what we are is because of Jesus' death and resurrection, and then we are justified. And in the case of Galatians, we are justified to come to the table, to mm -hmm. take part of the table. So, so, so yes, uh, we have a. Uh, Elevated, uh, and, and what I'm going to say is what Enterprise says is caused controversy. It's a secondary, uh, second tier doctrine. <laughs> uh, we have put it in first tier and make and made it the gospel. And I think mm -hmm. that um, uh, that we have to also take into consideration that the reformers didn't get everything right. <laughs> that yeah. they still need to be um, adjusted. Um, and so uh, my second question would be. Um, the concept of allegiance is central to your book, well, it says in the title. Uh, can you explain what you mean by allegiance and how it differs from traditional understanding of faith and salvation? Yeah, and so I, I use allegiance um, interchangeably with the word loyalty or fidelity um, and or faithfulness, like that it emphasizes mm -hmm. more like our ongoing um, posture toward a king, like that he's the king and that we're acknowledging him as king and trying to live our lives um, in such a way that we are loyal to this king. So I use allegiance in that broad sense. Um, I don't have a really narrow definition of that. So loyalty, fidelity, faithfulness would all be synonyms for how I want to use the word allegiance. But I like the word allegiance best because it, it reminds us that the metaphor of the king is the key metaphor, that Jesus is the Christ, right? That's the key way in which we relate to the king. So I prefer that um, allegiance language because I think it fronts his kingship better than some of the other um the other language we could use. Um, and so, yeah, as maybe the best way to understand what I mean by it would be by comparing it to some traditional understandings. So St. Augustine um, w was very, very influential in his own day. But then beyond that, 
Um, he impacted um, the whole development of medieval Catholicism and also the Protestant reformers. They're really all doing mm. their theology in an Augustinian key. They all look to Augustine and essentially assume Augustine was more or less right and are wanting to show that their theologies align with Augustine one way or another. So um, Augustine had argued that faith, um, on the one hand, means the doctrinal content to be believed, that it's the, the set of beliefs that we need to affirm. So that it would be an intellectual assent kind of idea to the beliefs, mm. but also he argued for uh, um, a, a second meaning of faith that was um, not uh, just the, the the doctrinal content, but the more effective personal dimension that that needs to be true for us. That that there's a faith by which we believe that needs to be a faith that is true for us, and that's the the kind of the combination would be the personal appropriation idea. Like he really saw those as the as um, defining faith. Um, going beyond that, then, when we get to the Protestant Reformation, uh, the, this is a big conversation that we could have. Um, but there's a division, um, a further division of some of that um, uh, into um, different parts, looking at Luther, looking at um, Melanchthon, mm -hmm. Calvin, some others. Um, and uh, one one way of, of, of doing that would be to talk about how there needed to be, um, following Augustine, a, a notitia would be the Latin term, like there had to be an intellectual content to, to believe, and then you need to a census, you need to assent to that content, the personal dimension, kind of like mm -hmm. Augustine. But then there was a third thing added, the, fid the fiducia, uh, which would be um, the idea of that you are trusting um, in the promises of God. Um, and so mm -hmm. thinking about all of those together um, would be, those would be some classic ways of thinking about faith. What I'm arguing in the book is that those tend to be disembodied inappropriately, that they don't respect the ancient meaning of the word faith um, as that was used in an exact way in antiquity, the word pistis, uh, which is a big word, this pistis word or pistis, um, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, it's a big word with lots of different um, ranges of meaning in antiquity, uh, but it certainly includes ideas of loyalty, Oops. faithfulness, allegiance, and that, I think, got downplayed during the Protestant Reformation um, and, and really with the medieval Catholicism, too. Both sides, I think, were missing the embodied nature of, of pistis, which is more of a relational and externalized term. So what I argue in the book is that we need to have a threefold new definition of faith. Um, on the one hand, we would include the idea of belief, like believing true content. Right, that um, what what's the true content you need to believe in order to become a Christian? Well, you need to believe the gospel, right? The gospel itself would mm. be what defines the the content you need to affirm to be true. That the gospel represents truths, right? Um, and uh, we can unpack the gospel more later on. Uh, the second part, then beyond that, would be that you need to swear fealty. You need to swear your loyalty to King Jesus. Uh, this traditionally would have been in the earliest church something you do as part of your baptism. Uh, that at your baptism, mm -hmm. you would have sworn loyalty to the, to King Jesus. You're baptized into his name. That's what it means to be baptized into his name, would involve ideas of giving loyalty. And then finally, there's an embodied fidelity, an ongoing embodied allegiance or embodied loyalty to the king, that it's something that you live out over your subsequent Christian life as part of your, your externalized relationship to King Jesus, and that all three of those are involved in saving faith in the New Testament. So the claim would be that those three components are essential to understand understanding saving faith so um if i'm if i'm um, hearing right those who are blaming that your point of view is leading us to catholicism um they themselves are following augustine uh which is not wrong but uh a doctor of the church Yes, um, I think to a degree that's true. Um, there's there would be a, a variety of different reasons why people mm. like have different ways of putting this. Through. Some would be like uh, like some, for instance, Protestants who are concerned about this proposal uh, might be part of what's called the free grace movement where they believe mm -hmm. that um, that you can't, like that works can have nothing to do whatsoever with your salvation, right? And that like we are saved by trusting in the promises of Jesus alone, that he's our savior. All we need to do is affirm Jesus died for my sins. The free grace movement would tend to say that that's all you need to do is you need to mentally affirm that Jesus died for your sins. And then they would say, well, of course you should live in, you know, like good works to your Lord afterwards, but your salvation has nothing to do with that. That's not been the traditional Protestant position. That's 
that's actually a, a misunderstanding of Protestantism mm. itself. Right? That was not Luther's position. That was not Calvin's position. That was not Melanchthon's position. That was not that was not the position of the earliest reformers or even the subsequent tradition. Um, that those free grace ideas only become prom prominent with certain individuals like Zane Hodges in the 1980s. Um, it was more of a that was more of a contemporary movement within evangelicalism. Uh, but the traditional doctrine would be that that you do have to do works as part of your perseverance within within or part of your sanctification, depending on how that's articulated. That would be the traditional Protestant position would be that your your works are not the basis of your salvation, but are the confirmation of it. But they're necessary. You have to do them as part of your confirmation of salvation. That would be the traditional Protestant position. As in Calvinism, um, the, the the debate between Calvinism and, and Lutheranism in Calvinism, uh, works confirm that your salvation, while in Lutheranism, works are for your neighbor. Uh, but they still talk about works, that you have to do something. Yes, you still do have to do them in either case, yes. Well, um, that's that's uh, very interesting, and, and thank you for, for telling us that little historical background of the of the Free Grace Movement, because uh, because I think it's, it's it's a reaction against uh, uh, salvation, lordship, salvation. I guess. Right. Yeah, and I don't know how this conversation has played out in the Spanish-speaking world. I, I'm not, for, unfortunately, not bilingual. I could read a little bit of Spanish, but not much. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I took it in high school, but it's been a long time ago. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yes, but I, it's, I'm mainly speaking about how this conversation played out, especially with John MacArthur, who is the leading proponent yes. of Lordship Salvation. And then Zane Hodges uh, was the leading proponent of fr the Free Grace Movement. And they both had a number of other thinkers that aligned with them. But John MacArthur's position is certainly the traditional, uh, the traditional Protestant position, where Zane Hodges' position was a more serious deviation from classic Protestantism. Well, in Latin America, you just to let, let you know, Paul Washer uh, has made it very famous, along with John Piper. They both mm -hmm. have made that position very famous, and um, it has created a big confusion as well. And um, so, so this book is actually going against it as well. So it goes against both that position and the free grace position. So, so it's it's amazing to see lordship salvation and free grace uniting against your position uh, it, it, it's a it, it's amazing thing that's uh, what's happening in the last two weeks um, interesting something that i i never expected to see that i never expected to see that so i'm, I'm very amazed yes yeah, so i i can i can see what you're what you mean but yes like um mm -hmm. yeah well our next question in the book you argue that understanding the gospel as the gospel the kingdom is crucial how does this perspective reshape our understanding of salvation and discipleship? Yeah, so we do have to have a King Jesus gospel because that's what the New Testament has, right? Um, the New Testament, as the most frequent summary of the gospel in the New Testament, is simply to assert that Jesus is the Christ. That is the most common summary of the gospel whenever you look at you know passages in acts where it speaks about the you know what the apostles were going out and gospeling you know to use the verb like the mm. summation is that jesus is the christ right that's the summation what is what ended up happening is that the christ title like got treated almost as if it was jesus's last name and like mm. and that it would almost be interchangeable to say that that i'm saved by jesus or i'm saved by christ like it's just one like it all means the same thing to most people the reality Reality is one's a name and one's a title, and that's this, this a quite different range of meaning. Like my name is Matt, but my title is Professor. They, they have different kinds mm -hmm. of um, associations and and different kinds of meanings, right? And so, um, losing out on that, I think, has caused people to not be aware of the degree to which that the gospel itself is shaped by a kingly claim. So we have to get that in in kind of um, in in the right order. Right, we have to understand that the king, that the that the gospel is a kingdom gospel, uh, because when we leave that out, then we we begin to think that salvation could come to us some other way, that it could come to mm -hmm. us like first by having a savior and then by having a king. That's not what the New Testament claims. The New Testament doesn't say like Jesus first saves you um, because he's he's forgiving your sins, and then after that you get a king. 
That's not the New Testament's claim. The New Testament is that Jesus, as part of the gospel, he was sent by the Father. He took on human flesh so that we could begin to see his glory. After taking on human flesh, right, then he he lives uh, for us a, an obedient life and then dies for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He's buried. He's raised. This is also for our justification that he's raised, um, as Romans 425 states. And then beyond that, right, then he's installed at the right hand of God as the king. Like he's, he's seated down at the right hand, right? And then he's now enthroned as the king, and now he's the divine and the human king ruling the universe. And so yeah. if we don't get that part as part of the gospel itself, right, we then we begin to think like, oh, first he became the savior and then he became the king. Well, it's actually through his installation at kingship that he begins to function as our savior too, right? As then, what does he do once he becomes king? He pours out the Holy Spirit, and that's what applies salvation to us. Like, we don't have the blood of Jesus applied to us until Jesus is seated down at the right hand after he's performed mm. his high priestly work, after he's been enthroned at the right hand, and then he can begin to apply the benefits of salvation to his people by sending the Holy Spirit. So we don't get salvation, we don't get rescued apart from Jesus' kingship. It has to come first. And we want mm -hmm. a savior before a king, partly because we we want the idea of just forgiveness without the idea of giving loyalty to a king, right? But it's through our God, it's through actually responding to this king that we're set free, right? So we need to kind of get that in the right order, or else we don't get how salvation works. Now, how does this connect to discipleship? That was kind of the second bit of your question, yeah. right? Um, and this connects to discipleship because we need to see that we're saved by loyalty to a king. And this is actually the process of healing or restoration for us. Um, that we don't, in order to be saved by God, we don't just need the blood applied. We also need to, that, that on the one hand uh, is essential, right? And it does um, break the chains of bondage. But on the other hand, like we need to see the king and see his glory, and we need to begin pursuing him in a posture of loyalty toward him. So that it's as we're gazing on Jesus who unveils the glory of God that we come to be transformed by stages into his image. So that that process of transformation is part of the way in which we're being saved. It's the restorative part of what we're being saved. So as I put it in my other book, Why the Gospel, we don't need to just be saved from, we need to be saved for, right? We're saved for a specific mm -hmm. purpose, and that purpose involves restoration. So we have to get both of those right. And the process of discipleship is the process of restoration and is essential to our salvation. You remind me of when I was I was more I was in the Salvador and I was going through the war, and a lot of evangelicals used to say, uh, "Who cares if they die as long as they die with Jesus? Who cares if they are hungry as long as they uh, if they die hunger with Jesus?" And 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 I think that does totally um, misuses Jesus' commands to go and 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 um, take care of the poor, uh, have mercy on people, uh, because. Today's society, the new king of the world is telling us that that's being a weak person. If you want to help those who are less fortunate than you, and, 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 I, and you being in the U.S., you heard that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I read Christianity today. I read um, Christian leaders, uh, the news that a lot of people um, are not willing to give the other cheek. Why? Because that's being weak. We're, we're not weak. Mm -hmm. We are strong people. So they have shown that they have pledged allegiance by consent, by uh, by by um, mental assent to another king, mm -hmm. and that's why they, they 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 reject Jesus' command to give the other cheek. So, so giving the other cheek um, has become um, what you were saying. It's it's a work. It's an act, bodily act that defines mm -hmm. us as having the rightful king, which king we're serving. And, and, and that's what impacts me of your book and of your proposal and what I think as well. I mean, I heard this before um, that it doesn't matter um, if if the people in Africa are going hungry. What matters is that if they hear the gospel, but the gospel is not good news if it doesn't come with everything Jesus gives you, gives you life, not only eternal life, but life here and now. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what people, I think, um, they think of the kingdom of God like something way, way beyond um, ethereal, while Jesus wants us to enjoy the kingdom of God or those vestiges of kingdom of God here on earth uh, in the church first, but also that we can also offer those uh, windows of the kingdom to the world. I don't know. Um, that's what I get from, from what you are telling me. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Louis. I think that's true. Um, I think that, yeah, what ends up happening is that we can lie to ourselves and say that the only thing that Jesus wants is for people to trust him. And that can be a disembodied thing, right? Uh, like trusting is something that only involves a little part of my brain, maybe, right? Mm. But like Jesus calls for everything um, and that we need to give loyalty to him with all that we are, uh, which means that if somebody is, yeah, is dying with Jesus, well, what Jesus are they dying with, right? Like the one that simply is the one that they're trusting in for forgiveness of sins or the one they're giving their whole loyalty to. If, if you're giving mm. your loyalty, like then you have to be obedient to your king, which involves caring for the poor and involves acts of social justice. So they're all bound up, right? Once we understand what the gospel is, which is why Paul in, in Philippians chapter one calls us to live as citizen, a citizen body of, of the, uh, mm. in, with respect to the gospel, right? As he speaks about this, he uses language of citizenship um, and that we're called to be citizens and the gospel constitutes a citizen body because we're underneath the king, right? Who is our authority figure, our Lord. Yes. Well, let's continue then to our fourth question. Um, many readers may be familiar with the concept of faith alone in Christian theology. How does your concept of allegiance alone align or differ from the traditional understanding of justification by faith? This is the, <laughs> this is the crux, uh, Matt. This is the crux mm -hmm. that makes a lot of people um, afraid or, or their hair is um, raised because um, they they said, oh, they, they're attacking salvation by faith alone. And does, does your position of attack it or raise that? Well, no, my position is to affirm it. I do affirm that salvation is by allegiance alone. But the, the, again, that what's at stake is what does the word faith even mean? What does the word pistis mm -hmm. mean? Um, and, uh, you know, the word in Greek is pistis. It's not, the word is not faith, right? So we have to, we have to go back to the original Greek and to determine what is, what is the actual range of meaning of this word? And nobody disputes that it also means faithfulness, loyalty, mm -hmm. allegiance. Um, and so we have to ask, like, like it also does mean trust. It means belief. Sometimes it means all those things. So by what right do we have to carve out certain definitions and leave others out, right? How does... How do we actually apply the, um, the word correctly in context becomes the question. Let me tell you, sorry, I had to go back uh, last week and copy with my phone the whole entry in BDAC because mm. people wouldn't believe me what you're saying. Mm. Wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe it. No, it only means this. And I said, this is what it means. And then I went also with uh, New International uh, 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 Dictionary of the Old New Testament Theology and Next to Jesus. I have to also... Uh, it was 23, um, and then I went to Mounds, both his lexicon and, and his mm. study word. I went to Fi, uh, uh, to, to, to Fi, uh, and I went uh, to another analytical one because mm. I wanted, because people were saying, no, you guys are lying. That it doesn't mean allegiance anywhere in the New Testament. And then when I show that, that when I show them, uh, this is what at least Fi. BDAG is the, as, as you said in, your, in one of your interviews, BDAG is the one that we have to follow. But then when I show them the other ones, in a sense, it stopped the conversation because nobody could come back and say that I'm lying or you're lying, saying mm. that it, this is this concept of allegiance is not pressing in the New Testament. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, yeah, I don't think any any New Testament scholar that I, I I could think of at all would it would disagree with the claim that faith can mean loyalty or allegiance or faithfulness. Mm. It it means that, and I would just roughly estimate about twenty percent, maybe thirty percent of the time in the New Testament, you you it needs to mm -hmm. be translated that way. Um, well, a, an example of that would be in Romans chapter three, where it says, "What what if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faith?" Um, that last mm. one, God's faith, has to mean God's faithfulness. Yeah. It can't mean God's faith mm. in something, right? But in Greek, yes. if you're reading in Greek, it's all just the word pistis. It's the same word, mm. right? And so um, you have to translate that one, faithfulness. And I, arguably, actually, you have to translate, I think, the better translation for all of the instances in Romans 1, 2, and 3. Uh, they all should be translated as faithfulness, actually. Um, and it's uh, it's speaking about the Roman community's fidelity, right? That that is manifest to the mm -hmm. world and that and that Paul is celebrating, right? As he's wanting to brag about how they have been faithful to God. Anyway, um, yes, it's, it's something that New Testament scholars don't really disagree about. It would be just on the popular level. There's misunderstanding about yes. the range of meaning yes. of pistis. Um, 
uh, anyway, yeah, so circling back to the question about how my Sorry. proposal, yeah, like relates to the faith alone question, um, I affirm that we are saved by pistis alone, whatever we might mean by that. Um, word pistis is what we need to figure out, um, but that the word pistis does involve our embodied loyalty, like that it does involve mm -hmm. dimensions of what have traditionally been called works, and that's where it can get controversial. Um, as I don't think that Paul himself thinks that works are uniformly bad, I think Paul is concerned with works of the Torah or works of law, which is a different kind of question and gets into the new perspective with James Dunn, N.T. Wright, um, and other people, um, and it's a much broader conversation than I can go into right now. So my position would be that um, that justification by faith is true. Like we are justified by faith. We're justified by faith mm -hmm. alone. Uh, we can even say that uh, once we qualify what we mean by faith with care. But that doesn't mean justification by faith is the gospel. Paul says something actually different and tends to be misread on this. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 16 through 17, um, where he's speaking about the gospel, he doesn't say that justification by faith is the gospel. He says that justification by faith is revealed in the gospel. And that's different, right? Mm -hmm. um, he uses the language yes. revealed. And so I think what Paul is speaking about is that the righteousness of God was revealed through the gospel, uh, but that doesn't mean that justification is the gospel. And um, there's a little slippage there that, um, that I think Luther wasn't quite careful enough about, uh, that little crack between the difference of revealing the righteousness of God and being the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. And when we read with care, I think we can we can establish that Paul sees justification as a benefit of the gospel, and he sees faith as the point of access to the gospel. It's how we respond. After God gives the gracious gift, after he gives the grace of the gift of the gospel, we respond to the gift by giving loyalty to the king. That's how we that's how we make the gift actual. That's it's how we reciprocate, as John Barclay would put it. It's, it's quite an uh, outstanding to see how Luther um, read his own um, depression <laughs> into the text. And I know he wanted to get something out of it. And this is what I said in one of my videos uh, last week. I don't I, I don't have to reproduce Luther's um, depression and I don't have to identify with his depression when he read scripture. I have another, um, I, I don't go through that. So I don't have to read a scripture through his lenses. I can go back to the lexicons and and see how and 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 rely on people like uh, Barclay or Wright to see how uh, pistis, what pistis meant in its context and how they were using it, and not necessarily as we in the West has redefined both a gift or grace and also faith. We have redefined faith. Um, to a to a way that uh, I don't I don't think New Testament readers would understand. And my final question today would be: Throughout the book, you emphasize the importance of living out one's allegiance to Jesus. Can you share practical examples or insights of how individuals and Christian communities can practically live out this allegiance in their daily lives and ministries? Yeah, and I think um, that's an important question because we all want to live out our loyalty to King Jesus more authentically and thoroughly. Um, but I also will say that I don't have any special expertise on that um, as I'm not a pastor. I'm a professor. I do my mm -hmm. best to try to live loyally to King Jesus in my own life, right, and to lead others through my teaching in that direction. Um, so I can only just offer a few, you know, um, mm -hmm. like insights that I would have from my own life. Um, one thing that's important to me is um, I'm a father of seven children. So trying to um, raise my children in the ways of the Lord uh, is something that my wife and I co-labor together to try to do. Um, and so we um, are actually have a complex educational system where uh, the youngest four are being homeschooled right now and the oldest three are in high school. Uh, and so they're attending mm. just a public high school. The youngest ones uh, we've homeschooled. And we've tended to try to do that with all of them up until around fourth grade or fifth grade uh, and sometimes longer, it depends on the child. Uh, but partly because we want to be very deliberate in leading them into uh, the, the basic Christian truths and to have more opportunity to uh, to read the Bible with them, to talk about moral values, to instill like a Christian moral framework about what it means to live a life of loyalty to King Jesus. Um, so uh, we do daily Bible readings, um, both as part of their education, uh, but also for the older kids, for our, my wife and I, we read a chapter of scripture each night before bed. Um, and we sing um, a couple songs. 
Um, we will sing some praise songs um, to King Jesus each night. Um, and that's mm. been something that we have found helps us to stay on the track of loyalty each day um, would be um, some of those practices. So that would be something that we do in our family. Um, in terms of church, I think that it's really essential that churches focus um, not on a division between evangelism, like, okay, here we have the evangelism team, and then we, here we have people who are doing discipleship. But we need to see that the path of discipleship uh, and the invitation to follow Jesus, that it, the invitation is to be a disciple. It's all one one package. Well, we've kind of created separate categories like, okay, like, and, and it's based on false understandings of the gospel. We, we, we tend to think, okay, on the one hand, we need to have people on team A over here, on team A who are telling people about Jesus. Mm. And then we have people on team B who are telling people about, okay, now once you've accepted Jesus, here's how you become a disciple. I think we need to be much more realistic in, the, in, in saying that, that the gospel is about King Jesus and us all continuing to acknowledge him. Now, sometimes we need to make an initial decision. That's part of, uh, you know, the, the task of telling other people the good news. But we need to always make a continual decision to follow King Jesus. And that is what it means to respond to the gospel also. That all of that is a response to the gospel. It's all part of evangelism and discipleship. It's all bound up. So I would advocate for a, a lot tighter connection in churches between evangelism and discipleship, helping people to see that the path of discipleship is the only path of salvation, uh, that that we need to always be calling all of ourselves to respond to King Jesus again and again and again as part of the gospel, right? Um, and it's not just trusting his promises, it's also about loyalty to a king, right? About following his way of life. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that they're following a pattern of living, um, they're following uh, an ideology that they become servants of that ideology or servants of that empire let's say and confronting people that can be a missional way of reaching people because people are very reject re, um, rejectful i don't know if that's a word rejectful of um of religion but if you um but everybody likes to talk politics i've never mm -hmm. seen anybody who doesn't like to talk politics so so once you tell them hey there's another way of life there's another king that you can serve that can be an opening um, to bring them the gospel. Yeah, and I think it's also, uh, I mean, practically speaking, uh, in terms of sharing the good news of Jesus with other people, I do think that a lot of people have been turned away or just turned off from the church by um, hypocrisy, um, by the sense of a lack of relevance of the gospel to their daily life, that like they were taught that all they needed to do was to one day pray a prayer and say that I accept mm. Jesus as my savior. And okay, well, I did that. Now what do I do? Um, and then people say, oh, like, like, you know, church leaders say, oh, well, we got to get involved with the mission or whatever it is. Like there's a next stage, but it's always presented as sort of optional. Like it's like, it's not necessary for your salvation. You did the mm. hard work of salvation, like by praying this prayer. That was the thing that really mattered was just if you ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins, um, then you're good with God. And there can be a lack of awareness that it's, no, it's our ongoing loyalty to King Jesus that is what saves us. It saves us in the beginning when we first confess loyalty to him. It continues to save us as we live our lives. So that it helps um, it helps people see why, um, like, I think it helps us understand why hypocrisy happens in the church, like that people have prayed mm -hmm. a prayer, but they didn't think they needed to continue to pursue Jesus. Uh, but it also helps us to maybe give people who, rejected the church because of hypocrisy to give them something else to think about. Maybe, maybe you haven't responded to the full gospel. Maybe people in the church aren't responding to the full gospel because they're not actually choosing to give loyalty to a king. And maybe that's why we see an illness in the church of hypocrisy, right? Is this um, mm -hmm. lack of loyalty to King Jesus. I'm thinking of, I grew up in USA. I, I, I went to the USA as a refugee. And then I came to Australia as a refugee. I mean, prop, uh, that was my visa. But when I became an Australian citizen, uh, at that time, they were still pledging allegiance to the Queen, mm -hmm. Queen Elizabeth. And, um, and I pledged allegiance to her and to her um, heirs. So the new king, King Charles, is my king as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Officially, he's the king of Australia. Mm -hmm. So I became a subject of this realm, British realm. And I'm supposed to give my allegiance to Australia, and when my wife became as an, an Australian citizen, they stopped uh, swearing allegiance to the to, to the royal family in England. 
mm. but they they still swore allegiance to the people of Australia. So the so she's expected to support the Australian way, to support the Australian uh, thinking. Um, but if she doesn't, then she does. She's not showing that she wants to be part of the community. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the way I can see. I, I can relate what you're saying regarding uh, all us pledging our allegiance to to a kingdom, to a country. To this is it's not something that I say. Oh yeah, I pledge allegiance to Jesus. In the future, I'll, I'll, I'll reign with him. No, no, no. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians, you're reigning now, right now, with him. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you should act this way. You mm -hmm. should do. You should be a better husband. You should be a better son. You should be a better worker. So, so that's how we show our allegiance to King Jesus, not to the ways of the world. Um, that's a pastoral way. Uh, Scott Van Knight has a book. Uh, I just like to mention it: The Apostle Paul in the Christian Life. I don't know if you're aware of that one. Um, um. Yeah, I, I don't remember if I've read that one, but I've read so much by Scott McKnight. He's one of my favorites. So, uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. You can see. Oh, the edited volume. I don't think I've read all of that. Yes. I might have read an essay or two mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. it now. But Yes. Uh, I remember when the new perspective came in, there was a master thesis done at Moore Theological College in Sydney mm -hmm. saying that that new perspective, that type of thinking would destroy Christian living, Christian ethics. Nah, no, I, I don't think so. And uh, Scott McKnight and others have written, and you have written that, nah, it doesn't work that way. It, it does yeah. help our ethics. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and, and more importantly, what really matters is what's true, right? And um, the reality mm. is that the new perspective on Paul, I think, has been uh, demonstrated from numerous angles to be much more likely to be true historically, right? It's, it's the historical mm. view. that It's called the new perspective, but it's the ancient perspective. And Matthew Thomas, for instance, yes. has written a book um, on this showing that uh, how the phrase works of the law, how is that interpreted in the time right after Paul? Like the earliest readers of mm -hmm. Paul, how did they understand the phrase works of the law? And he shows that um, they understood works of the law to be uh, to be kosher table and circumcision and uh, Jewish feasts. Um, and that, the, mm. that these are this is exactly what the new perspective on Paul has argued. So he shows that there's not actually a single instance that deviates from that in the second century. So the very earliest readers of Paul, they had the new perspective on Paul, right? Um, the very earliest <laughs> ones, uh, they had the new perspective yeah. on Paul. Yeah. So mm. it's the oldest perspective on Paul, the original. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you have anything to say to the Latin American community, Matt? Um, um, some suggestion uh, how those, because there's a lot of people uh, who follow uh, Kerigma, um, they are very much interested in um, in learning uh, more in depth this subject. Um, any any um, any good things that you can say? A a any advice that you can give us? Well, some of the key books, I think, you are some that you've already mentioned or that we've mentioned in our discussion. I think N.T. Wright's mm -hmm. collection, um, mm -hmm. especially his more scholarly books, New Testament and the People of God, Jesus of the Victory of God, Paul and the Faithfulness of God. Those are all, I think, really crucial resources for um, thinking through this topic more thoroughly. Um, James uh, D.G. Dunn uh, and his uh, various works. Um, on the new perspective on Paul are influential and I think more or less in moving in the right direction, um, although we could critique it um, and um, sh show some places where the new perspective could be sharpened. Nevertheless, I think it's working in the right vein. Um, John Barclay, his book, Paul and the Gift, mm. uh, very yes. uh, critical available. resource. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, uh, just understanding the cultural world of the New Testament is important. And I think of the work of people like David De Silva um, and who's done work on mm honor, shame, uh, patronage, and helping to, uh, us to understand like how grace, faith works, how, what would that have meant in the ancient world in general within a world where glory, like those terms all have meaning within a patron client framework. And that patron client framework dominated the way New Testament thinkers approach the world. So understanding more like the valence of those terms within patron client systems and honor and shame cultures, uh, that can be valuable as well. So those are some of the works um, that I would mention and some of the, the thinkers that I think are worthy of paying attention to. Okay, well, uh, there's a lot of suggestions that I'll have to make to some um, uh, editorial publishing houses. <laughs> uh, yes. I've, been beg I've, I've been begging for people to, to translate. Uh, 
Yeah, so this. the first one is called New Testament mm-hmm. the People of God. The second one the is people called of God. Je- yes. Jesus and the Victory of yes. God. Yeah. That has been translated. And also Jesus and the Victory of God has been translated. The, the Jesus, God. the Son of God has been translated. But the first one, the groundwork has not been translated, which is, oh, I find it fascinating because, yeah. because the, sec- the, the book number two and three has has been translated but number one the one that with hmm. all the all the groundwork is is, yes. is placed it has it has never been translated so i've been mm, that begging would be great to, yes so so uh so i have your endorsement to 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 push yeah. this uh line so so hopefully that uh, somebody will listen <laughs> all right thank you matt uh, th- uh thank you for your work and um and as as we know there'll be there'll be more of of, of matt uh, Bates, uh, Matthew Bates more or in Spanish coming soon. So, um, <laughs> so hopefully we're going to have another interview and you can tell us more about your work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Louis. Thank you very much. Gracias por ver el video hasta el final. La oferta que se está dando de parte de Querigma es que por la semana del 28 de septiembre al 5 de octubre, el libro de Matthew Bates estará a un 40% de descuento y si se pide otro libro en la misma orden tendrá el mismo descuento promocional eso sí el comprador siempre tendrá que pagar el envío pero van a tener 40% de descuento del libro de Bates y cualquier otro libro que estén comprando en las notas del video voy a estar poniendo eh, la, el link de publicaciones Kerigma para que puedan hacer de esta oferta y poder así eh, leer un libro eh, con 40% de descuento y si desean pueden comprar otro libro. Una vez más, esta promoción es del, del 28 de septiembre al 5 de octubre del presente año 2023. Así que déjenme un like, también eh, suscríbase a este canal y si así desea también eh, vea las notas del video donde va a poder ver dónde encontrarme, como también cómo ayudar a este canal por medio de PayPal, Patreon o si no, se pueden hacer miembros de este canal con 5, 10 o 15 dólares al mes y van a ayudar para poder hacerse el material que acá ustedes ven que yo les entrego. Que Dios les bendiga y hasta la próxima.